3, Ephesians chapter 3. And let's look to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you for the opportunity we have to yet again uh, open up the word of God. And Lord, we pray that you would help uh, this time to be a blessing to each of us. Lord, your word is precious. The truths that are contained in your word are indeed, Father God, needful for us. And Father, we thank you that you took the time to uh, give to us your word, that we could study it, that we could read it, that we could understand it, and that, Father, by your power we could live it. And we do pray tonight that as we open up the word of God, that our hearts will be blessed and refreshed by its truth. I pray that, Lord, as always, you give me wisdom from on high. I pray that, Lord, you would hide me behind the cross of Calvary and that, Lord, we would see no man say Jesus only this evening. And that, Lord, as your word is opened up, that we would indeed from it glean that which you would have for us, that, Lord, we would be challenged by your word. Lord, help us not to leave here this day without your word having an impact upon us. May it indeed uh, bless us, may it encourage us, may it challenge us, or maybe even if necessary convict us, Father God, that your word would have an impact upon us, that, Lord, it would do that which you sent it forth to do, and that, Lord, we'd leave rejoicing this night. Father, guide me, I pray. Give me wisdom, I pray, as I speak tonight, that I would uh, proclaim your word and truth. And Lord, may we receive all, may you receive all the praise and all the glory. And may we be blessed as we study your word together. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the Apostle Paul would undoubtedly have been one of, if not the greatest example of the believer that ever lived. When you consider his life, you consider his testimony, then he is one of the greats with regard to being an example for you and I. And one of the secrets of his greatness was that he was a man of prayer. And if there is any area in our lives as believers, and I know it's true in my life, and I'm sure it's true in each of our lives, if there's any area in our life which we're likely to fail in, one of those areas is the area of prayer. You know, prayer is hard work. Prayer takes time. Prayer takes effort. Prayer takes uh, from you and I to exert some energy. And, uh, you know, the devil doesn't want you and I to pray. He preferred it if we didn't pray. But if, like the Apostle Paul, we are to be men and women of substance, if we are to be examples, then we need to learn to be faithful in prayer. Like Paul, we need to pray for ourselves. We need to pray for one another. And tonight what I want us to do is I want us to start to look at this matter of Paul's prayer life. Well, Paul's prayer here for the Ephesian believers. Because what Paul prays for here in this passage is relevant to you and I. The things he asked for in his petition are relevant to you and I. And tonight we're going to start by looking, first of all, at the introduction to his prayer. And then we're going to embark upon the petition itself. We're not going to get very far in the petition because the petition is uh, fairly lengthy. And so we're going to see how far we get and we'll stop when we get to an appropriate place to stop. And we'll pick up the rest of his prayer the next time we're together in the book of Ephesians. But uh, first of all, tonight, let's consider the introduction, verse 14 and 15. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. You know, I don't know about you, but the first thing that strikes you when you read this passage is the position of Paul's prayer. He says in verse, 30, verse 14, For this cause I bow my knees. Paul is on his knees. Now you think, well, that's not very significant, and lots of people pray on their knees. But think about it. Paul's in prison right now. He's chained 12 hours a day to a Roman soldier. 
And yet he says, I'm on my knees praying for you. Could you imagine? That must have been quite an experience for the Roman guard, mustn't it? To have the man that you're chained to for 12 hours a day on his knees praying for the various churches. And so Paul's here on his knees before this Roman guard and he's praying for the church at Ephesus. Now the reality is we don't need to kneel to pray. You know, the word of God does not say the only position for prayer is kneeling. And that somehow that you and I, unless we've knelt down in prayer, then you and I have not prayed because there are various postures for prayer in the word of God. Abraham, for instance, stood before the Lord when he prayed for Sodom in Genesis chapter 18 and verse 22. Solomon stood when he prayed to dedicate the temple in 1 Kings 8.22. David sat before the Lord in 1 Chronicles 17.16 when he prayed about the future of the kingdom. And Jesus fell on his face when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane just prior to his crucifixion in Matthew 26 and verse 39. And I could have listed umpteen other examples of different positions of prayer with hands uplifted and with people uh, prostrate on the ground and so on. The Word of God does not make one position of prayer uh, significant. The point here is that Paul, uh, the point here is that the, uh, uh, the idea is uh, of praying is that we need to humble ourselves before God. And in this case, in Paul's case, as he kneels before the Lord in front of the Roman guard that he's chained to, it's a position of humility. And therefore, when we and I pray, we must bend the knee of the heart. At the very least, we must come with a humble heart. Go with me to Second Chronicles, please. Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles, chapter seven. And verse 14. 2 Chronicles 7, 14, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their land, and will heal their land. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray. The, the matter of prayer, the thing that's significant is that we humble ourselves. And the point here in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 14, when it says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The point here is not so much that Paul's on his knees, but that Paul has humbled himself before God. Paul wants them to understand that this matter of prayer, this prayer is a prayer to God, and he has the respect for God that God requires, and he humbles himself before his God by bending his knee. And when you and I pray, whatever position you and I pray in, whether we're kneeling, whether we're standing, whether we're sitting, whether we're lying down, whatever position you and I uh, have for prayer, then we must humble ourselves before God. We must come with the right attitude, in other words. You and I have to come recognizing that he is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and that you and I are coming before him and we're bowing the knee of our hearts before Almighty God as we come into his throne room, that we come with due respect. We come with a due reverence for our God, that you and I not flip in their prayers, that you and I show the, the true reverence that God desires as we enter into his presence. And that we don't just flippantly enter, but we enter with the reverence it belongs to God, that we humble ourselves before our God. Because if we don't, then our prayers will be ineffective. A wrong attitude in prayer means an ineffective prayer life. The Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, he will not hear me. It talks about it in Peter. It talks about the fact that if the husband and wife are not on talking terms with each other, that there's friction between them, then God does not hear our prayers. It's important that you and I understand the significance of entering into the throne room of God and that you and I come with bowed knees of our heart before Almighty God. We come with the right attitude and that we humble ourselves before him as we pray. And that's the point here. As Paul expresses this matter to the Ephesian church, 
about him coming to God the Father on bended knee, he's signifying that he's humbled before a holy God. The second thing that we notice in this prayer is the person of Paul's prayer. The person of Paul's prayer. In verse 14, it says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He bows his knee to the Father. Paul directed his prayer to God the Father. When you study the Word of God, you'll find that the majority of prayers are directed to God the Father. That the prayer, Paul's prayer here is to God the Father. Scripturally, prayer is usually directed to the Father through the Son by the empowering and direction of the Holy Spirit. That's why you and I usually pray, you know, Heavenly Father or something similar to that. And then we end the prayer in Jesus' name. For we pray to God the Father in the name of the Son and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we usually start our prayer with some reference to God the Father. We usually end our prayer with some reference to Jesus Christ. And we are praying in the power of God in the Spirit. And the Apostle Paul sets this pattern here. He prays to God the Father. The Word of God makes it clear that access to God the Father is in and through the Son. In fact, this passage of Scripture, the context of this passage of Scripture, makes that abundantly clear that in Christ made it possible for us to come into his presence. Go back with me to verse 11, please. According to the eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by faith in him. You and I have boldness, you and I have access to God the Father through Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul says, I bow the knee to God the Father because I know I have the power, I have the boldness to be able to come before the Father because of the work of the Son. And because of what Jesus Christ has done for us at Calvary, and because you and I are saved, you and I have a unique relationship with God. Look in verse 15. Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. So you and I are members of the family of God. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. But at salvation, you and I became members of the family of God. We became the children of God. And as children, you and I have the privilege of entering into God the Father's presence, of going into the throne room and crying, Abba, Father, and offering up our petitions to God the Father. And you and I can enter boldly into his presence because of our relationship to Jesus Christ. And if you and I were to be stopped at the doors of, uh, of the throne room of God, and asked on what authority you and I are entering into God's presence, we would say on the authority of Jesus Christ. You and I are coming to God the Father in the name of God the Son and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Because we're part of God's family, we have boldness to go to the Father. Like children, we can come to our Father and pray. Remember the... When the disciples came to the Lord and said, Lord, teach us to pray, remember what he said? Our Father, which art in heaven. This is the pattern of prayer. If you want to know how to pray, the disciples would teach to pray, the Lord said, this is how you pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. There's the reverence that belongs to God. There's the bending of the knee before God. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Before ever he gets the petitions, you know, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses and we forgive them the trespass against us. The due respect, the due reverence is given to Almighty God as we enter into his throne room and we bow the knee before him and we say, Our Father. And we'll pray for petitions before God, our Father. And we do it because we're members of the family of God, and because we're members of his family, then you and I have boldness and confidence by faith that come unto him, as verse 12 tells us. 
here is Paul's pattern for prayer as he starts out. He's on his knees in humility before Almighty God. And he's coming with boldness because of his relationship to Jesus Christ, who's given him access to the very throne room of God. And he's coming to God the Father to offer up his petitions on behalf of the Ephesian believers. You know, prayer should be a vital part of our lives. You and I ought to be men and women of prayer. And when we pray, we ought to take it seriously. We ought to realize that we're entering into the very presence of Almighty God. And you and I ought to come, we ought to pray to God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. For it's by Christ we have access to God. You know, when we pray, sometimes I think we, we, we kind of say the words flippantly, don't we? You know, dear Lord or our Father, we thank you. And then we say in Jesus' name. And, but these things are important. The beginning of the prayer and the tag of the prayer in Jesus' name are stating doctrinal truth. That God is our Father. That you and I have access to him. Because we're members of his family and we have boldness to enter in his very presence because of Jesus Christ. So when we say in Jesus' name, we're saying it's in the authority and, on the, uh, and because of our relationship to him that we're entering into your presence. These things are not just flippant taglines for prayer. These are important doctrinal truths that we're saying when we pray. So when we close out our prayer and say in Jesus' name, we ought to think to ourselves, Yes, it's because of him we're entering the throne room. Prayer is vital. And how we pray is important. That we pray in all humility and come boldly because of our relationship to Jesus Christ, because we're members of the family of God. The introduction. No wonder, therefore, if prayer is important to us, it ought to be. How important is it in your life? How important is it in my life that we take time to pray? Secondly, then, Paul comes to the petition. After he's told us what he's doing, he's told us why he's doing it, okay? He's praying to God the Father in the name of God the Son. He then embarks upon telling us what he's praying for, what it is that he wants for the Ephesian believers in verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that you've been rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height and to know the love of Christ with path of knowledge that you might be filled with all fullness of God. You know, prayer is one of the foundations for growth and stability in the Christian life. If you and I are going to amount to anything as believers, then prayer must be a vital part of our lives. It ought to be something that we do not only, you know, with our devotions, but something we do throughout the day. Prayer ought to be something that's vital to you and I. And Paul was a great man because Paul was a man of prayer. In fact, if you look at the Word of God, you find the great men of God in the word of God usually are men of prayer. And the two goes hand in hand that those who are people of prayer, those who had a relationship with God daily in prayer, were usually then the men who were the, and women who were the, 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 the faithful believers, the ones who stood out from the pages of God's word. And here we see Paul's example of prayer. Or the example of Paul's prayer life. And he makes, in these verses, verses 16 and 19, he makes four requests of the Lord for the church at Ephesus. Now, we're not going to get to all four tonight, obviously, because I've already spent nearly 20 minutes on point one. So, uh, uh, you know, if we have another four points or 20 points each, you'll be here for a, quite a while. That would be another 80 minutes. And I don't know that any of you really want to be here that long. So don't worry, I'm not going to give you all four. What we're going to do is we're going to start upon the petition, see how far we get, and then we will come back to the rest of it later. But I wanted to get to the petition 
because I couldn't stretch out the first point any longer. I thought I would be laboring the issue to go any longer. So uh, the petition, first of all, notice what he says in verse 16. He prays that they might be strengthened. In verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That we might be strengthened by his spirit in the in, in the inner man. Paul asked that they would be strengthened with might. That is, that the strength would be according to the riches of his glory. Most glorious measure. This is a great passage, a great verse. He would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That the, the might, the strengthening of a might by, might be in direct relationship to his riches in glory. That is, in the abundance of his glory, proportionate to the riches of his glory. That you and I would indeed receive of God the might, the strength that we need in the inner man, directly proportionate to the glory of God. that the power that would be unleashed for the believers would be in direct relationship to how powerful God is. It's not according to the narrowness of our hearts. It's according to the riches of his glory. You know, if God was to give to you and I strengthening a man according to the narrowness of our hearts, you and I would be very weak, wouldn't we? You know, in all honesty, we are not very strong in our faith for the most part, are we? You know, every one of us, as we look at our lives, really could do with strengthening our faith, our trust in God. And I, I think that no matter how long we live, the reality would be that you and I would always want to trust Him more. And if God strengthened you and I in relationship to the narrowness of our hearts, then you and I would be feeble indeed. Because our faith is often weak, isn't it? But Paul prays here that our, that our strength would be proportionate to the riches of his glory. That the strength that you and I would receive has nothing to do with how little our faith is, but how great our God is. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 11 puts it this way, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. And the Apostle Paul here when he prays, he prayed that the strength would come through the Holy Spirit. Notice what he says in verse 16. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit. By his Spirit. That that indwelling Holy Spirit that you and I received as salvation, that the power of God would be unleashed in you and I by the Spirit of God which indwells us. And that's why it says that that power is to be in the inner man. That you and I in our new nature will be strengthened by all the resources of the power of Almighty God, the riches of God, would be so enlaced in you and I that you and I would indeed be able to stand spiritually strengthened in the inner man to the glory of God by the power of Almighty God day by day. But that strength would be in the inner man. He's not asking for physical strength here. But he's asking that you and I will be strengthened in the inner man. This is not physical, this is spiritual. This is God-given power within the believer. Therefore, however feeble we might be physically, God wants you and I to be spiritually strengthened, spiritually strong. That we have a strong spiritual constitution. That you and I are able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We're able to stand against the enemy. That you and I might have power so that we don't faint in the face of opposition. 
that we don't faint at tribulations, that we don't faint at trials that beset us, that you and I stand firm in this day and age. One commentator put it this way, believers in Christ need fresh supplies of strength to enable them to exercise grace, to perform duties, to resist Satan and his temptations, to bear the cross and undergo afflictions cheerfully and to stand unto the end. The Apostle Paul knows that as believers what we need is spiritual strength. We need a spiritual enabling. We need a spiritual empowering in the world in which we live. This is a blessing that comes from God as a gift of his free grace. Notice what he says here in verse 16, that he would grant you. The word grant simply means give. Paul says, I pray that God will give to you the strength that you need in the inner man to bring glory to God. It's a gift of grace. And beloved, you and I need to pray daily that God would give to us the strength that we need, that the grace that we need daily to live for him. That God would empower us daily, that God would strengthen us daily, that God would enable us daily to be what he wants us to be, and that it only comes as you and I spend time in prayer. As you and I bow our knees uh, before the Lord in prayer, and that's the spiritual knees, we bow our hearts before the Lord in humility, and we pray before him, and we ask him to empower us, to enable us to be what he wants to be. He will unleash in us spiritual power in the inner man that we might indeed be what God wants us to be day by day. You know, we, we live in a generation whereby we're under attack. And we know the devil today, more than ever in any other generation, attacks the mind. The battle is a battle for the mind. It's a battle of the inner man. And we need spiritual strength. We saw this on Wednesday night. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 6, please. Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. And the power of his might put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world. Against spiritual wickedness in high places, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins good about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet show with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith, and wherewith you're able to stand, uh, to, sorry, quench the fire darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. We're to stand. And then what it says in verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication of the Spirit and watching thereto with all perseverance and supplication of all saints. Prayer is important. It's a vital part of our weaponry. And as we pray, we will be strengthened in the inner man to be able to stand against the walls of the devil. We need to pray for strength to stand. As you see today, the battle for the control of our mind is real. Everywhere we go, there is a, a, a very real battle for the control of our minds. If the devil can control our thinking, if he can control our, uh, the way in which we see things and think about things, he will indeed be able to control our lives and control the flesh and cause you and I to live defeated lives. We need God-given strength. And there is an inner man just as real as the physical body. And we need to understand the importance of strength in our physical body. But many are exceedingly weak in their inner man. You know, we, we spend a lot of time looking after this flesh. And taking care of this flesh, and when you're a little bit older, you tend to take a little more care of it than when you're a bit younger. You're aware of the, the creaks and the aches and the pains. You're aware of your diet. And you're aware of what you do and aware of what you put into your body. And you're aware of, of the physical 
nature of your body and you are uh, apt to take care of it. But I wonder how little care we take of our inner man at times. And yet there is a battle raging today for control of our minds. In our day, we need to be strengthening our minds. You know, the battle today for the control of our minds through media in all of its forms is more than it's ever been before. Whether that be the computer, whether that be the tablet, whether that be the smartphone, whether that be the Xbox, whether that be the TV, whether whatever it be, media is all around us now, and the devil is... Is you can use the media to cause you and I to be a corrupt in the inner man, to be weakened instead of strengthened. Now, all those medias can be used for good, and all those medias can be used to be a blessing, and all those medias can be used in a right way. But so often what happens is that you and I can become so uh, 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 addicted to those things that they become uh, our life and become our soul and they become controlling the inner man and all we can think about is those things. Whether it be social media or whether it be normal media, whatever it might be, it can become so addictive that we become weakened in the inner man. And in this generation, it's worse than it's ever been before. You know, when some of us were older, were younger, there was no such thing as a smartphone. There was no such thing as a mobile phone. There was no such thing as a computer. A tablet was unheard of. Well, tablets are what you took. Uh, not something that you were able to read or anything else. Uh, you know, uh, when some of us were older, were younger, there wasn't a great deal of media. In fact, uh, a TV was not as prolific as it is today. Uh, I remember when I was younger, there was simply just... Uh, Four channels. In fact, when we came to Grafton, there was two channels. So all there was 27 years ago, there was the ABC and, and the MBN, which was just a conglomeration of channels, shows from all the other channels. That's all there was when I came here. Things have changed. In the last 20 odd years, things have changed so much now that we have all this access to media right at our fingertips. We can cart it around in our smartphone, in our pocket. The, it's there before us, and you and I can become addicted to those things, and we find that we're, we're not strengthening the inner man, we're weakening the inner man. The battle is the battle for our minds today, and you and I need to be strengthened today more than ever in the inner man. And so you and I need to take time to pray. And ask God to strengthen us in the inner man. Because many a man is exceedingly weak in the inner man. Now notice what it says here in verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. According to the riches of his glory, not out of the riches of his glory. It's according to the riches of his glory. Now, to illustrate that, you know, if, if a, a billionaire was to come in here tonight and that billionaire was to give you a dollar, out of his billions, then he would be giving to you out of his wealth, his riches, he would be giving you one dollar. But if he was to walk in here and give you a million dollars out of his billion, he would be giving to you according to his riches. And that's the point here. God does not give to you and I out of his riches. He gives to you and I according to his riches the strength in the inner man that we need. Nobody's shortchanged. Isn't that wonderful? Every one of us have available to us from Almighty God all the strength that you and I need, all the power that you and I need in the inner man to be what God wants to be. There is not one of us here tonight who are no Jesus Christ as Savior who can say that God does not have enough strength to give to me to be able to live for him. You see, our failure in the inner man is not because there's a failure shortage in the power. It's because you and I have not tapped into the power source. Available to you and I is all the strength that you and I need in the inner man. And like the Apostle Paul, you and I need to come to God the Father in the name of God the Son 
boldly into his presence daily, and we need to ask God to give to you and I the strength in the inner man that we need for that day to live for him. And that strength comes to you and I partly through prayer and partly through the word of God. As you and I are reading God's word, then you and I are renewed in the spirit of our minds. Isn't that what Romans 12 tells us? To be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And you and I are to be renewed daily. We're to be strengthened daily in the inner man. And as you and I spend time in the word of God, and as you and I spend time in prayer, then you and I are entering into the very presence of Almighty God, into the very throne room, and when we pray before him and we read his word, then what God does for you and I is he strengthens us in the inner man so that you and I might indeed be all that he wants to be, that we might stand against the wiles of the devil in the evil day. Because you and I daily have put on the whole armor of God. Because you and I daily have been strengthened by his might in the inner man, according to the riches of his glory. God's strength and God's power is available to all of us. It's there for each of us. There's not a soul here tonight who cannot tap into this power. Every one of us can have the victory. Every one of us can have the empowering. Every one of us can be what God wants to be because God has promised to give to you and I according to the rich of his glory everything we need for life and godliness. The battle for the control of our mind is real. And you and I need to be strengthened in the inner man if we're going to stand in the evil day. So daily we need to pray for God's strength to live for him. Prayer is important. Prayer is vital for you and I. Prayer is necessary. If you and I are going to be what God wants to be, you and I need to take the time to pray daily. And we need to take the time to pray in his name. In the name of Jesus Christ, come boldly to God the Father that we might be strengthened by his might. You inner man. Now there are three more requests in verses 17, 18, and 19 that we'll see next time. There is no doubt that prayer is important and vital for Christians today. If prayer was important and vital in Paul's day, in book back there in the first century, back in this book of Ephesus, a book of Ephesus in the church at Ephesus, it's certainly true today. There is a battle raging for control of our minds. And you and I need to take time to pray. Prayer is not a burden, but a gift to be enjoyed. And daily we need to pray, for prayer is the source of power in our lives. Prayer ensures that we have a close relationship with the Lord. We need to take time daily to pray. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you for the Apostle Paul and his prayer life. We thank you, Father God, that here he gives to us a challenge with regard to our prayer life. The Father, we might indeed uh, understand the necessity to pray to you. That as your children, we can come boldly into your presence in the name of Jesus Christ and offer up our petition before you. And the prayer is vital if we are going to be strengthened in the inner man by your might. If we're going to be what you want us to be in this world that is sin struck, Lord, we need to take time to pray. Lord, help us to be men and women of prayer. That we might be all that you want us to be to your glory. 
as we seek to serve you. Lord, commend your word to our hearts and challenge us by your word this night, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take a hymn books, please, and turn to hymn number three.